This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are critically important. You can protect yourself online with Surfshark. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. On the western coast of Wales, rising above a stretch of golden sands, it's one of the most picturesque fortresses in the whole of Europe. Built in the late 13th century, Harlech Castle was the last word in medieval engineering, an impenetrable outpost capable of withstanding years of siege. The brainchild of the great military architect James of St. George, it made use of natural defences in such an inspired way that it's today listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, one of Gwyneth's premier tourist attractions. Yet while Harlech may today be among Wales's most celebrated destinations, things weren't always this way. Far from being a symbol of Welsh pride, it was originally built as a base for subjugating the native population. Constructed on the orders of Edward Longshank, in 1283, Harlech grew out of the English's conquest of Wales. Yet its rich history goes beyond mere oppression. Over its lifetime, the castle would play important roles in the Wars of the Roses and English Civil Wars before finally being reclaimed by the very people it was meant to dominate. It was known as the Ring of Iron. In 1283, the English king, Edward I, stood amid the wilds of northwest Wales and decreed the construction of a series of impenetrable forts dotting the coastline surrounding the rebellious region of Gwynedd. Built quickly and to exactingly high standards, the resulting castles would represent perhaps the greatest construction project ever undertaken in Wales. A project so monumental it would make Offa's Dyke look like something your drunken uncle might knock up in his backyard. It's from Edward's decree that the UNESCO-listed castles of Conwy and Carniff and Sprang, the latter said to be modelled on the walls of Constantinople. From it too, we get the fortress town of Denby. But the undoubted high point of this construction spree was Harlech Castle. Squatting on wild shores below the mountains of Snowdonia, Harlech was perhaps the pinnacle of medieval military architecture. Costing the equivalent of about $13.5 million in today's money, it was as near to invulnerable as a castle could be. Protected on two sides by crashing waves and sheer rocks, and defended on the others by imposing curves and walls. Yet the castle wasn't designed to be merely defensive. 1283, you see, was the end point of the English conquest of Wales. Rather than protect Edward's own people, Harlech was intended to secure his newest possession, to keep the Welsh firmly under the English boot. After all, England's kings had been trying to take control of the country for decades. The twisty, turny story that led to Edward's invasion begins way back in the post-Roman period, as what is now Britain embarked on centuries of seismic change. It was in the early years of this upheaval that the Anglo-Saxon and pushed up towards the island centering, and came into direct competition with the Celtic Britons living there. Not that they called them Britons. The newcomers already had the perfect word in their vocabulary, one that's today translated as others, strangers, or foreigners. That word? Welas, or to use its modern English version, Welsh. But while the Anglo-Saxon kings would be able to push these strangers out the fertile plains and into what we now call Wales, they'd never come close to conquering them. Hence things like Offa's Dyke, a vast earthen embankment built up by the Mercian king to separate his people from their Welsh rivals. And so things went for centuries, two rival peoples separated by a frontier, until the Normans arrived and blew everything apart. The 1066 Norman invasion was the medieval equivalent of one of those Independence Day starships arriving over your city, only with no Anglo-Saxon Jeff Goldblum to save you. In no time at all, William and his clan had seized control of the Kingdom of England. By the end of the century, they'd pushed into and taken over most of Wales, another conquest to add to the family's growing collection. However, Wales would prove far tougher to hold than England. In the face of multiple uprisings and insurgencies, the Normans were eventually pushed back, leaving in their wake a hybrid Wales cleaved in two. On the frontier lay the territories of the Marcher Lords, powerful fighters who were loyal to the Normans. Beyond this border zone lay what is sometimes called Called native Wales. A constellation of principalities, native Wales, was where descendants of the Celtic Britain still dominated, free for the most part from interference from England. This meant a different language and legal system, different customs, different rulers. As the 12th century rumbled on, it also came to mean utterly different lifestyles. Beyond the lands of the Marcher Lords, Wales was a pastoral society, a place of wild woodlands and untamed mountains, home to some 300,000 people. England, by contrast, was becoming steadily more agricultural, creating new towns and cities, building cathedrals to cater to its four million strong population. 
For a while, these two nations managed to coexist on an unequal footing, one that saw the many Welsh princes periodically required to perform some public ass-kissing of the English king. Still, it's not that the king had the strength to permanently subdue Wales. At least not yet, because as the 13th century swept by, two leaders were going to emerge. One Welsh, one English, and both determined to put the other in their place. It would be the fight between them that would directly lead to the creation of Harlot Castle. The 13th century prior to 1277 was a pretty good time for Wales. What had once been a collection of warring statelets was beginning to slowly coalesce into something more unified. While the old custom of dividing rulers' lands on his death still bled to noble brothers beating hell out of one another, it was becoming less frequent, especially given the rise of Llewellyn IV. Known in English by his nickname the Great, Llewellyn was Prince of Gwynedd, but he was also the best damn leader in the whole of Wales. During his reign, he managed to effectively unite native Wales, placing himself as the head of the princes, who now swore fealty to him rather than the English king. Now, Llewellyn's gains didn't really survive his death in 1240, and the end of his successor's six-year reign saw Wales once again fragmented. But what did survive was the idea of a Wales united under one Prince of Gwyneth. And when the original Llewellyn's grandson, Llewellyn Ab Griffith, came to the throne in 1246, it was with a determination to resurrect this idea as quickly as possible. In this, the younger Llewellyn was have an unlikely ally, Simon de Montfort. An English nobleman of French origin, de Montfort was all about three things. Early parliamentary democracy, rabid anti-Semitism, and absolutely d all over King Henry III. In fact, de Montfort was so good at the last part that he launched the Second Baron's War, effectively removing the king from power and placing most of England briefly under his control. It was during his short, unofficial reign that the Baron tried to ensure a stable rule by signing something called the Treaty of Pipton. Written in 1265, the treaty was basically Montfort's way of saying to Llewellyn, you know, please don't screw up my big moments by invading England, all right? By now, Llewellyn was well on his way to restoring his granddad's hold over his country. The treaty codified this, allowing him to call himself the Prince of Wales. Remarkably, this honour would survive Simon de Montfort's defeat. In 1265, the Baron was killed by Henry III's son, Edward Longshanks, a process that led to the monarch's restoration. But when the returned king met with the Prince of Wales two years later, it wasn't to do battle, but to codify everything Montfort had agreed to. Signed by Henry III, the Treaty of Montgomery reasserted Llewellyn's supremacy in Wales. So weakened by the Barons' War, there was nothing else the English could do. While the treaty required Llewellyn to pay homage to the king, there was no doubt who the real winner here was. For the next few years, Llewellyn was living the dream. Acknowledged prince of all his countrymen, capable of launching devastating raids against martial lords like Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Gloucester. But then, the weak king, Henry III, went and died, and things went downhill fast. England's new ruler, you see, was old Mr. Longshanks, known from 1274 as Edward I. And Edward I was a guy who really really loved war. So when Edward invoked the treaty to demand the Prince of Wales pay homage, only for Llewellyn to be all like, nah, I'm good. Thanks, though. It was all the excuse that the new king needed. Capturing Llewellyn's fiancée, Eleanor de Montfort, Edward tried to force the Welshman's hand, saying he wouldn't discuss freeing her until it received homage. Llewellyn countered, saying he wouldn't pay homage until Edward freed her. By November 1276, communication between the two had broken down. On the 12th of that month, the English king made a fateful decision. If the Welsh prince wouldn't do as he was told, then Edward would just have to teach him a lesson. All right, we'll get back to today's video in just a second, but first, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Surfshark. Here's something you may already be aware of. The internet's a weird place. There are people out there trying to steal your personal information or track your Instagram habits to bombard you with weirdly specific ads. No one needs any of that nonsense. One great thing about Surfshark is also their hack lock protection. They search online for your passwords and let you know if it's popped up somewhere, somehow. That way you change the password and boom, you're nice and safe. But also you've got great streaming options when you use a VPN. Just think about Netflix, right? Netflix has loads of options, but they absolutely vary depending on which country you're in. You fire up your VPN, you go over to another country through the magic of the internet, and you will 
will find a whole different set of options on Netflix and I'm sure other streaming services as well. Surfshark is also totally unlimited, so if you want to download a movie in raw 8K, well, absolutely go nuts if you got the TV for it. Also, there's no logs, there's great support, and a 30 day money back guarantee if you don't like it. Right now, you can get 83% off and three months for free at slash geographics or just follow the link in the description box below. And now back to today's video. The conquest of Wales unfolded over two distinct phases, one which went merely badly for Llewellyn and one which went so shockingly awful that it couldn't have actually gone worse. The merely bad phase began in spring of 1277 when Edward ordered the Marcher Lords to push into native Wales from all sides and basically just screw Llewellyn as badly as they could. Sadly for Wales, it turns out that screwing the prince over was something the Marcher Lords were extremely good at. Equipped with bigger armies, sturdy war horses and vast financial reserves, the Marcher Lords cut such a swathe of destruction that some of the Welsh princes switched sides, among them Llewellyn's own brother, Dafid. But it was what happened in July that really ended Welsh streams of independence. That month, Edward's main army marched across the border in such force that there was nothing Llewellyn could do but retreat. Backed by 800 horsemen, up to 15,600 infantry, 26 ships, and 1,800 axemen, whose only job was to chop down woodlands the Welsh defenders might hide in, Edward's army blazed a trail across the country's north. But they didn't leave only destruction in their wake. As he made his way along the coast, Edward instructed his men to start building castles, starting with Flint and Rudlin. It was the beginning of the Ring of Arn, of the great forts from where English power would be projected across the landscape. But Edward wouldn't yet have need for the greatest castles like Harlech, because as the king encircled Snowdonia and sent his men to ravage Anglesey, Llewellyn would play the only card he had left, surrendering. Signed in November of 1277, the Treaty of Aberconwy stripped Llewellyn of the title of Prince of Wales, reducing him to merely one more prince among many. Remarkably, though, it still allowed him to keep control over his home of Gwyneth. Even at this stage, it seems that Edward didn't have the resources to completely annex England's neighbor. But that didn't mean he wasn't going to act like the sorest winner in history. Life in this reduced, controlled Wales turned out to be unbearably annoying for the remaining princes, even those who'd deserted Llewellyn. In fact, they got so unbearable that, in March of 1282, his turncoat brother, Dafid, launched his own rebellion, one which pretty much everyone soon got in on. And so we come to the second phase of the conquest, the one that went catastrophically. At first, things seemed to be going well for the Welsh. They took control of towns and castles and raided far enough south to burn down the newly constructed Aberystwyth Castle. They even managed to hand the March Lord's butt to them in battle. Sadly, though, this would turn out to be false hope. A way for Lady Luck to laugh all the harder when she finally brought her gold toe cap boot crashing into Wales' collective balls. The first disaster was Llewellyn's death in a minor skirmish on the eve of a giant and decisive battle. The second was the absolute routing of the Welsh once the battle actually started. With an estimated 3,000 killed on a single day, the morale of the survivors utterly collapsed. As the English pressed their advantage, a polite way of saying that they ravaged the countryside, the remaining princes decided to kill the uprising to save themselves. Having betrayed his brother back in 1277, it was now Dafid's turn to be betrayed, handed over to the English by his fellow Welshmen so that he could be hanged, drawn, and quartered. So how do you like those apples to feed? For his part, Edward seemed to have taken a lesson from this latest uprising. One that would be bad news for locals, but excellent news for fans of military architecture. That lesson was that a few small castles wouldn't be enough to contain the rowdy Welsh. No, if he wanted to utterly dominate the country, then a new generation of garrisons would be needed. Outposts that would be the medieval equivalent of parking death stars in the skies above Alderaan. And he had just the man in mind to build them. Of all the military architects alive in Europe at that time, few had the pedigree of Master James of St. George. Born in 1235, James had spent a lifetime building defensive structures, throwing out great works in what are now France and Switzerland. But it would be the set of castles he built for Edward's Ring of Iron that would become his lasting masterpieces. Above all, the great castles of Conwy, Carnarvon, and Harlech. 
Construction began in June 1283, before Defeat had even been executed. On site, a vast team toiled away under Master James, consisting of 115 stonemasons, 30 blacksmiths, 22 carpenters, and 546 laborers. What a sight it was. Situated on the wild western coast, Harlech was positioned to help surround rebellious Gwyneth, lest another uprising happen. But it wasn't just for political reasons that it stood where it did. The spot Master James had chosen made perfect use of natural defenses. Although the waters have today receded in Edward's time, the north and west sides of Harlech opened directly onto the sea, a sea at the bottom of a 60-meter drop. For attackers, this meant two angles of approach were effectively blocked. For defenders, though, it meant a small jetty could be installed with over 100 rough-cut steps leading up to the castle to resupply in times of need. The eastern and southern sides, too, came with defences. On one side, a moat, on the other, a ditch carved from the rock itself, an extremely labour-intensive task. Anyone who approached was to do so at a serious disadvantage, and that's before they even got to the entrance itself. Only accessible via a long wooden bridge, Harlech's huge, double-towered gatehouse was close to impenetrable. If an enemy force managed to reach it, they'd be faced with three portcullises and two heavy wooden doors, all watched over by something known as machicolations. A fancy word for what are also called murder holes, machicolations were little holes cut into the ceiling above the entry where defenders could rain heavy objects or boiling tar onto an invading force. But I say an army did manage to smash its way through. They still wouldn't have won. Castles of this era used a Mott and Bailey design, with Bailey being the harder to defend first line of defense, and the Mott the impregnable fortress you ran to when things went south. Only Harlech had two Baileys, an inner and an outer, and this meant that attackers would first have to breach the castle itself, then the wall leading to the inner Bailey, and then have to deal with a Mott. And that's just Master James's original design. After a Welsh uprising in 1294, a whole extra wall was added around the rock the castle stands on, one with platforms for artillery. Thirty years after that, Two extra defensive towers were placed at the bridge. The result was a whole series of natural and man-made barriers piling atop one another until even the most dim-witted attacker could see attacking Harlech would be suicide. The only option would be to siege the place. But even this might end in you giving up and slinking home while all the other armies laughed at you. Harlech's inner sanctum sea was designed to withstand encirclement. There was a vast granary and kitchens to keep people fed, a well for drawing water. There were even latrines built into the outer wall, so waste disposal wouldn't be a problem. Add to that the jetty and secret steps for bringing in supplies, and it's easy to see why Harlech was able to survive a seven-year siege during the Wars of the Roses. But all of this didn't come cheap. At the height of work, it was estimated that the castle budget swallowed £240 every month, a colossal sum. At the time it was completed, Edward had sunk £8,184 into it. Including additional work done after the king's death, in 1307, it's thought Harlech cost the equivalent of $13.5 million in today's money. While this was still a staggering expense, it was also a comparative bargain. Carnarvon, with its walls echoing those of Constantinople, was almost three times as expensive and such a vast undertaking that it remained unfinished by the time both the king and master died. Yet the proof of Harlech's awesome might comes not from how much it cost, but how it fared in warfare. That's right, it's time for us to dig into perhaps Harlech's greatest claim to fame when it became the center of the longest siege in British history. Although the conquest of Wales can be said to have ended with Edward's victory in 1283, that didn't mean the Welsh were happy to just lie back and let a bunch of English pansies prance all over them. 1294 saw a vast uprising on the island of Anglesey, one so severe it led to Edward ordering the construction of his last great castle, Beaumaris, a project requiring some 3,000 workers. But while the 1294 rising may have been swiftly crushed, the same can't be said of its sequel a century later. In 1400, Owen Gwynedd launched a war of independence that lasted 15 whole years and would lead to him being declared the Prince of Wales. It would also lead to Harlech falling out of English hands for the first time. Despite the castle's seeming impregnability, it was garrisoned by only 21 men when Owain came calling, at a time when resupplying by boat was impossible thanks to French ships offshore. So understaffed, Harlech quickly fell. Recognizing its potential, Owain moved his court there, effectively transforming it into the seat of the Welsh government for five years. It took a massive invasion force, headed by by the future king Henry V to retake the castle, and even then they had to bombard it constantly for months before those inside surrendered. But while its short spell as centre of Welsh politics shows how important Harlech was, it was a much broader conflict that showcased its true military potential, the Wars of the Roses. 
A series of civil wars that shook Britain across the 15th century, the Wars of the Roses pitted the House of Lancaster against the House of York in an epic brawl for the English throne. Since Wales was at the time under English control, though, the fighting spilled out beyond just the borders of England. In fact, it spilled all the way to Harlech. The actual ins and outs of the Wars of the Roses are way too complex for us to go into here. Hopefully, we'll soon get a chance to cover that on our new sister channel. War of graphics. Right now, though, all you need to know is that throughout the fighting, Harlech had remained loyal to Henry VI and the House of Lancaster. In 1461, though, this became a major problem. That's because the 29th of March 1461 saw the Lancastrians get absolutely crushed at the Battle of Toton. So crushed that their Yorkist rivals were able to go on the offensive, ordering Lord Herbert into Wales to destroy any outposts of resistance. Come the end of the year, the only place still holding out was Harlech. Now properly garrisoned under Commander David Ap Ifen Ap Inion, the castle represented a daunting target for anyone, hence the Yorkist decision not to attack it. The new king, Edward IV, decided it would cost too much in lives and treasure to be worth the effort. Instead, he ordered those inside to be placed under siege. The hope may have been that any will to fight would crumble after a few months. If that was his thought process, though, the king would be in for a hell of a shock. Rather than quickly falling, the castle would hold out for a whole seven years. In this, the garrison was aided by continued sea access for supplies, and a siege that was less an unbreakable ring of iron and more an extremely porous bit of soggy washcloth. The siege saw Harlech become the House of Lancaster's base of operations in Wales, a place from where they raided the countryside, cooked up plots, and even launched invasions. In 1468, for example, the Earl of Pembroke landed there to begin his march on Denby, a march that culminated in him taking the town and establishing a new seat of government in the deposed king's name. It was these sorts of shenanigans that eventually caused Edward to snap and demand the castle be taken. But when it did fall, it wouldn't be under brutal bombardment. With the siege tightened in the summer of 1468, fewer supplies were able to get through. Perhaps bored of staring at the same walls all these years, David Ab Aignon agreed to surrender in exchange for a pardon. Harlech fell on August the 14th, while some of the English Lancastrians were dragged off for execution. The vast majority of those inside, though, were officially pardoned. Had Master James of St. George still been alive, we like to think this conclusion would have made him rather proud. After all, his great castle had done its job. Not only had it been stormed, it had kept attackers at bay for longer than any other besieged site in British history. The fall of Harlech in 1468 marked the last time it played a vital role in history. While it would be besieged again during the English Civil War 180 years later, the force of royalists inside amounted to a mere 16 men. Although they held out against parliamentarians for a year, They'd eventually surrender in 1647. With that, official interest in the castle faded. That same century, it was more or less abandoned, beginning its slow decline into a picturesque ruin. Today, Harlot Castle is, of course, no longer an active fortress. Rather, like Conwy, Bomaris, and Canafran, it's instead a major tourist site, drawing tens of thousands to this wild, beautiful region of Wales every year. Nor is it any longer in English hands. For years now, Harlech has been owned by Cadwa, the, the state body responsible for protecting the country's heritage. Ironic, really, that a place built to oppress the people of Wales would wind up ultimately making the Welsh government money. So that's the history of Harlech Castle, then. One of wars, violence, sieges, and oppression. See, one way this maybe makes it quite a dark place, a reminder of the blood once shed in the fight over this wonderful landscape. Seen another way, though, it also gives an air of romance, amazement at the knowledge that so much of Welsh and English history was decided here at this picturesque coastal fort. The saying goes that familiarity breeds content, but not in the case of Harlech Castle, a place where the more familiar you are with its history, the more awe-inspiring it becomes.